And thanks so much for the invitation. I'm super excited to uh, to give this talk today. So it'll be a it'll be a two part talk, and I'll explain both why the nearest black holes are quiet, but white dwarfs are are not. So by quiet, I mean quietness or loudness in the in the X-ray sky. So let's begin with the with the quiet X-ray sky. What can we what can we learn from a from a non detection basically? So from the from the non detection, I'll describe in a bit. I'll set up the the, the observations and what we learned from them. Um, but I'll actually start with the takeaways. So the first thing first thing that we learned is that accretion can be very inefficient, and this is very different from the typical Shakura Sunyaev thin disk model. Um, where in those cases, you know, if, if you if you just have the sun, a good energy conversion factor that I like to think of is James Bond, 007. Um, the energy out is 007 mc squared. But thin disks are highly efficient. And that's often what I write in proposals to say that this is why they're interesting to study. Thin disks, especially in high accretion state X-ray binaries, can reach remarkable efficiencies of around 10%. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, it's a, if in the worst case, we need to um, like wait for like half a year. Um, we will find a way. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I think that was someone just muted. Um, so that's in the that's in the um um in the best case when you have uh when you have a high efficiency in the the thin disk scenario. Um, what I'll be showing here is that at low accretion rates, where the where m dot is much much lower than, for example, the Bondi Hoyle Littleton accretion rate, um, you actually have remarkably low efficiency, lower than ten to the minus four. Um, the second main point of the first of the first half is that detecting isolated stellar mass black holes is pretty much hopeless except for microlensing and maybe except for their astrometric effects on, on surrounding stars. And the, the final point that I'll make is that systems like the ones that I'll be talking about in the first half of the talk are actually very rare. Um, I'll be talking about Gaia Black Hole 1 and Black Hole 2, but those are those were fairly, very differently selected systems compared to the previous pop population of, uh, of known black hole systems. Um, initially, these were thought to be perhaps abundant due to how Gaia released their data, due to, you know, they just selected pretty bright stars that were pretty nearby. Um, but I'm actually going to try to convince you here that that they're actually pretty rare. Um, both of these systems will evolve into black holes accreting from a giant. These are known as symbiotic X-ray binaries, but no, no such systems with a black hole accretor have been seen. So from those numbers, um, we can go ahead and estimate that these Gaia black holes, not only are they an interesting discovery, they're actually quite rare. There's about less than 10 to the four of these in the Milky Way. Great. So um, I'll begin with the, with the landscape of stellar mass black holes and where we are right now. Um, someone just yesterday asked me, why are black holes interesting? And perhaps the, the best summary that, that I can explain is, well, they're the only part of space-time that we know that's completely causally disconnected from our part of space-time. That's kind of an elegant summary. Um, but the initial final mass function, binary evolution, stellar explosions, plenty of reasons why uh, stellar mass black holes are interesting. And we know of about two dozen systems that have been dynamically confirmed. That is, they have follow-up spectroscopy of the donor star of the companion to show that it, it must be a very high mass object um, accreting from it, so, uh, so a black hole. Um, all of these systems that we know are actually very far. The nearest is about 1.5 kiloparsecs away. That's AO620, a very famous system. A lot of them are toward the, toward the galactic center, about eight kiloparsecs away. And they're all in remarkably short orbital periods. Um, the longest orbital period systems have an orbital, orbital period of about 10 days. Most of them are about a day or few days. So that all changed when a uh, Gaia data release three came out in, uh, in 2022 um, and Gaia black hole one and black hole two were discovered by, uh, by Kareem, Kareem el -Bajri. Um So he describes the, the, the discovery in those systems very much in, in his paper. 
But the, the two things that should stick out in this part of the phase space is that they're a lot closer than the known than the previously known population of, of black holes. And that actually they um they're much, much wider orbits. So black hole one is about 500 parsecs away. Black hole two is about um, one kiloparsec away, closer than AO620. And this is what these systems look like. So they're they're both in an orbit of about a couple AU and have periods much longer than, than any previous system. Black hole one orbits a sun-like star, very boring G-type dwarf. Um, black hole two is a little more interesting because it orbits a K-type red giant just ascending the, the giant branch before the, before the red clump. So the systems that we know of, these X-ray binaries, a lot of them were discovered because they go into some X-ray burst or they're in kind of a persistent high state of X-ray accretion, sort of near Eddington. Um, they also reach this Eddington luminosity when they undergo these bursts. And these systems are very, very, they have very short orbits as I've, as I've demonstrated in the, in the previous plot, short orbital periods, separation about a couple R sun. The big difference here is that these Gaia black holes, they're about as far from, the, the star is about as far from the black hole as we are from the sun. And from this cartoon here, you can see that we feel the effect of the solar wind. It interacts with our magnetosphere, knocks out satellites every once in a while, gives us a nice show if you're far enough north or south. But that's the point. We feel the interaction with the solar wind. So why shouldn't the Gaia black holes, why shouldn't those also be accreting winds? So the, the first thing we did kind of in the, in the inverse of the scientific method before the hypothesis, first we said, let's go ahead and look. Let's go ahead and see if, um, if Gaia black hole one or two have any X-rays or radio. Um, as I said, all of the previously known stellar mass black holes in the galaxy have been found in X-rays and a lot of them are also radio detected. Stop squinting, there's, there's nothing there. I'll just, I'll just um, settle that now. So the, the first top images are from a uh, Chandra exposures, 20 kiloseconds. Um, and then the bottom two are from the VLA and Meerkat um, after four hours of, of looking at them in the radio. But what, what did we actually expect? Um, so actually for the, for black hole one, I said that's a black hole around a sun-like star. We expect a sun-like solar wind, a sun-like mass loss. And that's about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year. Um, the, the, and, and what we found are actually the black curves. So I'll start, I'll start with the black curves. If you assume spherically symmetric accretion, this bondi hoyle littleton accretion, then we would follow basically these black curves where the only two parameters that we're varying here are basically the efficiency of accretion. So that's just the ratio of observed x-rays over m dot times c squared. Um, that's here on the x-axis. And the other thing that you can vary is you can say, well, maybe the winds slow down a little bit as they get close to the black hole. So if you say that the wind, the, the, the wind of the, um, of the sun-like star is its escape velocity, barely enough to leave the star, that's, that's setting beta equals one. Um, but you can say, okay, it slows down by a factor of three-fourths, it slows down by a factor of a half. Um, and those are these other, these other curves here. So you can see that um, from the Chandra limit that we have, if the if the accretion had been incredibly efficient, almost at the same as you know the uh, the X-ray binary thin disk scenario, um, that would have been about ten percent, maybe you know 0 0.01. Um, then then we could have seen the system in the X-rays. If you undertake a slightly more detailed analysis and calculate what the um, what the efficiency could be, then that's where you get these black points. So indeed, in retrospect, after sort of calculating the accretion rate, um, you can see that it it was probably a low chance um, that, that Chandra would have seen it. Um, but it never hurt to look. So the other thing um, that, that we calculated are for these models of hot accretion flows. A particular popular variety of them is called advection-dominated accretion flows. Um, so I'll talk about those in uh, in about two slides. And those in those accretion models, they say two things. 
The first one is that a lot of a lot of the accreted material doesn't actually make it down to the event horizon, and a lot of it is lost to winds. So the actual m dot that reaches the black hole is reduced by a factor of one percent. Goes down to one percent. Um, the other thing that it says is that these are very hot accretion flows. So a lot of the energy is stored as entropy and turbulent motion rather than radiated away. Um, so this then reduces the efficiency by even more. And that's how you go from basically these, maybe we could have detected them to it's absolutely hopeless. We wouldn't have seen black hole one. Um, black hole two is a little different. So as you as you might know, um, in in red giants, those have those have much stronger um, stellar winds. And as you get to, to later type stars, those are earlier type stars. Those have uh, stronger winds even. So in this case, it's twenty times stronger than black hole one, um, the the mass loss rate by this star. And what was and th this calculation we did do before before pointing Chandra and um, and Meerkat at the system. Um, in the Bondi Hoyle Littleton accretion model, even assuming sort of realistic values of uh, of the efficiency here, we would have detected it. We should have seen it. It's a little bit farther than black hole one, but because of this stronger wind, also because of the lower escape velocity needed to for the wind to actually eject from the star, um, we really should have seen winds from black hole two accrete onto uh, onto the black hole. Um, so again, this isn't the case that we had just this spherically symmetric Bondi accretion. So once you invoke these hot accretion flows, that again, that reduces the M dot, in this case, a little bit more dramatically, and it, it also reduces the, uh, the efficiency. So that's how you get basically from, we would have seen this black hole even down to efficiencies of 10 to the minus four. That was, we were really hopeful there. Um, that's how we get from there to, oh, you know what? After you take into account this corrected um, accretion model, then there's there's no way we would have seen it. This this upper one maybe hints that future X-ray missions could uh could catch a glimpse at it. Um anything post-axis or post post links, whatever, whatever mission um ends up following. So what does this mean? Um as I've said, black hole two should have been detected even at low efficiencies, and we can invoke a reduced m dot and a reduced um, um, efficiency. And this is actually nothing super new. Um, so there's there's been three very well studied black hole systems in the Milky Way where this effect has already been seen, um, and this has been seen in Sag A star as well as two very famous um, stellar mass black hole systems. Um, some of the two nearest ones, AO620 and V404 SIG. And this is what, what, that, uh, what that model looks like. So as I said, in these advection-dominated accretion flows, the energy is stored as entropy rather than radiated away. And um, this, is, this is the prediction of the thin disk model. This is the one that's wrong. This is the one that's, that's incorrect, um, the one that, that has higher efficiencies. So this is, this is data. Um, these little points here are the are the data in the optical. This upper limit is from the extreme UV, and then this trapezoid-looking thing is the X-ray data with the error bars for for this system V four hundred four sig. So, what the thin disk model predicts is something less hot than what these advection-dominated accretion flows predict. In X-ray terms, it's called a softer spectrum. In these low accretion rates. When the when the rates are are low enough, you just don't have that much heat from the um, from the accretion disk. So you expect the peak to be somewhere between the extreme UV and the uh, and the soft X rays. So it should appear as a as a very sort of low energy X ray spectrum. That that was the smoking gun back in back in the late nineties. That's what told people, you know what this this does not at all match the data does not at all match the model. Um, something has got to be fixed there. We would expect a much higher X-ray luminosity, especially in soft X-rays, um, if the thin disk model actually did work. So here's where you introduce this uh, um, this corrected model, this ADAF model, and what you can see is that both it both squares with the with the non-detection the EUV, and the other one should have been detected, 
And it also matches the much harder X-ray spectrum. Um, you can just assume different values of, of beta here, but um, it, it matches across, across the board in a way that the thin disk model doesn't. So the thin disk model is still a good approximation of very high accretion rate regime. But uh, the main point that I want you to take away is that that model is not good for the low accretion rate regime. That should be, that should be corrected. So, so what implication, what, what other implications does, does this have? Um, a very, you know, this calculation has been done a couple of different times now. Um, and one of the questions to ask is, well, you have all these isolated black holes, as I mentioned in the abstract of, of my talk, just by counting the number of O stars in the, uh, in the Milky Way, you should expect about hundred million, 10 to hundred million black holes to be in the Milky Way. Um, they can accrete from the interstellar medium. Can you see this in x-rays? So by constructing sort of a model Milky Way, distributing these black holes approximately in the way that we see x-ray binaries, giving some velocity distribution, even though that's completely unknown um, for, for isolated black holes, we end up that none are detectable by current x-ray surveys. So this is once you account for the reduced accretion rate, once you account for the reduced efficiency, and here I'm just showing a plot of the X-ray flux. Lower values are to the right. Number of black holes are up here. Um, and sort of the numbers that you'd expect passing through an H2 region, through the cold neutral medium, through the warm neutral medium. Um, and these are the limits of, um, of Erosita, which I'll talk about more in the, in the second half of the talk here, and then Chandra. So Chandra maybe sees 10, but um, that's uh, th that would be very difficult to, uh, to detect blindly. Um, and this is in contrast to a very famous paper from 2002 that did this exact calculation, um, but assumed pure bondi hoyle littleton accretion. It was kind of at the time when, um, when these hot accretion flows were taking off and people still weren't quite sure what to make of them. Um, and this paper got a lot of people excited. This, this said Chandra should see about 1,000 isolated black holes. Um, even then, people kind of knew that Erosita was going to be a new, a new X-ray mission sometime in the future, that one should see a couple hundreds. Um, so I toned down the excitement. I said with, the, with these new accretion estimates, um, much fewer should be seen. And the, and the final point of this of this uh, first half of the talk is, so how, ma how many of these systems are there? How many of these Gaia black holes are there? Um, two of these were discovered in Gaia data release three, but what's to say we can't just keep finding more out there now? Um, I ran MESA models for, for these systems, just evolving the, the donor star in the, in the black hole system. So this is, this is an HR diagram of both systems and where they are today. Black hole one is down here in the main sequence. Black hole two is sending the, sending the giant branch. Um, what's remarkable is that both of these systems within a Hubble time, um, actually black hole one within a few giga years and black hole two within about a hundred mega years, will overflow their Roche loads. So they're not going to get as close as a lot of the, the X-ray binaries we know of today because the stars are much bigger, um, but they'll still overflow their Roche load and have sort of the disk accretion, have X-ray outbursts, be the symbiotic X-ray binaries that we see um, in the case of neutron stars and, and the other X-ray binaries that, that erupt in the galaxy. So these are going to be visible, as I've, as I've said a couple times now, as these uh, symbiotic black hole X-ray binaries. Um, so remember that, that these black hole binaries, these X-ray binaries, they burst in the X-rays, and that's, that's how we discover them. And they burst so bright, they approach Eddington luminosities, that current, current telescopes, and back, back to the 70s, actually, X-ray X -ray missions back until the 70s, the current ones just happen to be Maxi and then Swift Bat. Um, those are sensitive to basically all of these systems to within a few kiloparsecs, four or five kiloparsecs. Um, basically through the whole galaxy, if they do approach the adding to luminosity anywhere in the galaxy, these, these systems should be picked out. But we haven't seen any that are black hole plus red giant systems. So a good, a good way to sort of put an upper limit on the on the amount of of the systems that that could exist is you just take the the lifetime of of the donor star divided by the time that um the system should spend uh an outburst 
that is what we get from the from the Mesa models, the time that it's in this Roche lobe overflow. And from that, we can go ahead and put some put some estimates for for black hole one and black hole two. So black hole one here, I'm saying there's maybe about a hundred systems, black hole two, maybe about a couple thousand systems. There's this detection efficiency, maybe when we are switching from Uhuru to the high energy astrophysics observatory, maybe from when we were switching to that, whatever, we could have missed something, even with like saying that we missed 90% of these systems or 99% of these systems, um, there still should be less than about 10,000 of these particular systems in the, in the Milky Way, which is a lot more rare than, for example, what was, what was initially stated on the, on the discovery paper. Um, so the paper on this was just accepted to, uh, to PSP, so I encourage you to check it out for, for a lot more detailed info um, if you have any, um, any details you want to you wanna look up. Um, so I'll conclude this part here. I'll conclude um, the, the first half of the talk and say that Gaia Black Hole 2 should have been detected in x-rays, but it wasn't. Um, and we can explain that by reduced accretion rates and inefficient accretion. Once we take this improved model of, uh, of reduced rates and, and efficiency, um, and we replace traditional bond equal Littleton accretion with that, we can predict that basically zero ISM black holes are going to be detectable in x-rays. Um, and the final point here is that Gaia black hole one and black hole two, um, by just showing Mesa evolutionary models, those systems will become symbiotic x-ray binaries, things that will burst, things that we should see across the galaxy. Um, because no such systems have been detected by, by X-ray monitors, we can go ahead and put an upper limit on, on these Gaia black hole systems. Cool. So I think, I think for the sake of time, I'll take questions for both the first and the second half toward the, toward the end. Um, but if there's anything crucial that comes up, please, uh, please stop me at any time for, for any other questions. Um, so we talked about the, the quiet X-ray sky, and now... Let's let's move on to the loud X-ray sky. So, what's interesting about um, about the the loud X-ray sky? Um, X-rays reveal exotic accretion in white dwarfs, um, and that's that's the other main topic of of my of my thesis to study to study X-ray emitting um, accreting white dwarfs. And what's th this has kind of been known for the last for the last um, for the last few decades, but Really, it's been recently when we've we've seen this this stark difference. Um, if you optically search for um, for accreting white dwarfs, these are these are systems known as cataclysmic variables. You the easiest way to find them is you just look for outbursts, almost in the same way that X-ray binaries are found in in the X-ray. Just look for outbursts. the The problem is that if you look if you're looking at white dwarfs. Um, if you just look in the optical, the systems that are going to be outbursting are going to be these cataclysmic variables. I'll call them CVs. Um, these CVs are the ones that have a big, broad accretion disk like this. And it's the thermal instabilities in the disk that lead to the outbursts. Whereas if you look in the X-ray, um, you'll pick out very different systems like this that are direct stream to stream accretion. And these are magnetic white dwarfs where the, where the magnetic pressure is able to equate the ram pressure um, outside, basically outside of the of the white of the white dwarf, far enough away where no accretion disk can form. Um, so there's maybe only one other type of system in the in in astronomy where you have direct stream to stream accretion, as you do in these very exotic um, magnetic CDs. Um, and, and it's an exciting time to look at the loud X-ray sky, not just a quiet X-ray sky, um, because this is the X-ray sky today. These are galactic sources. These are things within our galaxy that I'm showing you. I'm not going to talk about anything extra galactic here. Um, so these are just some X-ray sources in, in, um, in, in gray that I'm showing, um, active stars in, in, um, in green, young stellar objects in, in orange, and then some of these CDs here in, here in red. So this is what the sky looks like today. If you pull up ROSAT, which is the last all sky X-ray survey. In one week, this is gonna completely change. In one week, 
um, that we're going to have unprecedented depth compared to compared to the last All Sky X Ray survey, um, and that's going to be thanks to the Erosita telescope aboard the uh, the SRG mission, um, and that's going to be the deepest All Sky X Ray survey since 1990, basically. So I'm going to focus on some of these systems. These uh, I haven't explained what these symbols mean, but I'll explain what these uh, pointed triangles mean and why they really only come out in very deep X-ray surveys and why they're why they're so interesting. So those little triangles that that I showed you are ultra compact CDs, um, and these are known as AMCDM systems. So these systems by ultra compact. I mean that you have two stars orbiting each other at periods as short as five minutes to 65 minutes. Um, that's, that's the upper limit. So for these systems that are like five, 10 minute long orbital periods, they're, they're so compact that they can fit entirely inside Jupiter and even entirely inside Saturn. Like these are like these are two systems orbiting each other um, that can fit inside a planet. They're ridiculously compact. Um, and because of this, the shortest period of these systems um, are gravitational wave sources. These are decaying due to gravitational waves. And LISA, which is going to fly in about 10 years, will just pick thousands of these systems. Just blindly, it can, it can find these systems emitting um, gravitational radiation. One of the craziest things about these ultra-compact systems when they were discovered, and it remains, it remains a huge puzzle today, um, is that three formation mechanisms, three formation channels were proposed um, to explain them, but the main channel is still unknown. All these three maybe work or maybe none of them work, and it really takes discovering more of these systems um, to determine that. And there's only about 60 to 70 of, of, of these known. Um, so with the X-ray, we can easily double that. So I'll be talking about, about um, an X-ray plus optical discovery of mine that, that was done um, by, by combining, by doing multi-wavelength astronomy, basically combined, doing a cross match of the X-ray plus optical. Um, so these are, the, on, the, on the left here is, a, is an X-ray image from Erosita. Um, I've been collaborating with that team for the, for the last year. And basically, this, this should encapsulate why it's so powerful to do multi-wavelength cross matches. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's no need to do machine learning when you just have x-rays. In this whole patch of sky, you have one x-ray source for all of these 50 optical sources. So if you really want to find what the interesting one is, just, just look in the x-ray, just look in the radio, just look in whatever frequency you're, interest, you're most interested in looking at. And that'll already eliminate basically all of the noise, all the false positives, and allow you to focus on, on your sources of interest. Um, so in this case, this is, this is the cross match between uh, the x-rays and the optical, where the x-rays come from the deepest ever all-sky x-ray survey, and combine that with the optical, um, with ZTF, the Zwicky Transient Facility. And this is the deepest optical northern sky survey. So if you combine the two deepest surveys in, in two regimes, you'll, you're, you're, you're bound to find something. Um, uh, ZTF scans the sky basically once every two days. So there's unprecedented um, there's an unprecedented amount of, uh, of data in, in the light curves. And, and that's thanks to the, to the very big camera of, uh, of ZTF. Um, so I take X-ray point sources from, from Erosita. This is, this is the, the map. Of uh, of Eurozita from its from its first semester of of scanning, and this is the the northern sky map of of ZTF. So what you're seeing here in the in the color bar for ZTF is the number of points in a light curve. And on average, with the newest data release, there's about 700 points per light curve sampled every two days. So I'll remind you one more time: in the in the optical, CVs are are identified via bursts. And you'll get systems like this. Um, this is what a ZTF light curve looks like of, um, of one of these CVs called a, called a dwarf nova. And it's sort of relaxing at you know magnitude of 18, it bursts. These are, these are the dwarf nova outbursts caused by the thermal instabilities of the disk. Um, they last about five to 20 days. Um, and they range anywhere from like two to like eight magnitudes. Um, if they're any brighter than that, then they're usually called a nova. 
Um, but the problem is that these exotic systems don't erupt. Some of these magnetic systems, some of the systems where the accretion rate is so low, some of the ones that might have like a propeller mechanism. Um, there's another flavor of these systems called white dwarf pulsars that are, I don't have time to get into. Um, these systems don't erupt either because the accretion rate is so low or because there's no disk at all. And these systems look super boring in ZTF. If you're just looking in the optical, it's super boring. You see a super faint star at like 20th mag just sitting there not doing anything. That's why you need to bring in the X-rays. Um, so, so for this um, ultra compact CV, for this AMCVN system that, that I'm going to discuss, um, we began with the X-ray detection. And then we said, okay, let's look at the let's look at the ZTF data. Um, and it indeed looks very boring. So there's no real outburst there. There was actually a lot of coverage missed in the ZTF light curve because it was on the edge of a camera gap. You know, things things happen um, in a, in observational astronomy that that prevent you from from getting the best data sometimes. Um, but what but what I do is I then apply you know a variety of period folding algorithms. You can assume that this is a periodic signal and try to search for for some power in the in the periodogram. And it turned out that this source indeed had an orbital period of 55 minutes. Remember that the range for these AMCVNs is five to 65 minutes. So by the time I, I start this talk and the time I end this talk, this system will have undergone one orbit completely. And what you can see here, um, why I picked out this system with this periodogram was because it has a pretty deep eclipse. So it's really hard to see just with the ZTF data. Again, that's why the X-ray plus optical is so, so crucial. Um, it allowed the initial investigation. If we had just seen this in the optical, we would have said, maybe there's a period there, maybe there's an eclipse, um, but we're not sure. Um, and when you're not sure what the system is, just go ahead and grab a spectrum. And um, this was really a remarkable spectrum where you can go ahead and see in, in black all of the helium lines. Um, some of them are in absorption. Some of them are in emission from the, from the helium-dominated accretion disk. You have ionized helium, helium-2 here, which is indicative of either very sort of very ultra-compact systems or very hot accretion. Um, you need to ionize helium, which is, which is very difficult to, uh, to excite that line. Um, it's polluted by a ton of different elements, sodium, magnesium, calcium, nitrogen, all of these, all these pollution of these elements, they come from the donor star. So when you get a spectrum like this, you can go ahead and constrain at least to first order what formation mechanism um, led to the led to this particular AMCVN. Once you do this for a lot of systems, either with SDSS, DESI, any of the upcoming spectroscopic surveys. Um, we can then get a much much better sense of the population, what what formation channel is is dominant. Um, and this is the red side of the spectrum. Here you can see much more clearly the the disk emission lines in the um, in helium, and and they're double peaked, which we expect from a, from an accretion disk, as you have one side red shifted, one side blue shifted toward you. And so once once we verified, okay, this is an AMCVN, it looks like it's eclipsing, we can follow it up with high-speed photometry. I'm just showing you the eclipse here, and indeed it's it's eclipsing. Um, this is high-speed photometry from the, um, from the five-meter telescope at, at Palomar, um, and we can model the system to basically determine the white dwarf and the, and the donor parameters. So um, this th these were a series of... Uh, of, of Mesa models run by Diogo Bologna, and, and he sent this to me immediately after um, uh, after we published this paper, and said, "Hey, you know what? Your your system with with the parameters that, that you derive from from the eclipse completely disagrees with the helium star formation channel, completely disagrees with the white dwarf formation channel, and is very consistent with um, what's called the evolved CV formation channel." I'm not going to go into detail of what these formation channels are. Um, but basically, if you have an eclipsing system, if you're able to determine the, the binary parameters precisely, then you can go ahead and constrain this channel. So I encourage you to, to check out the, the paper for more. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and describe one more system um, that's that's come out of this. Uh, it's a joint, basically it's a joint Eurozeta plus ZTF survey that, that we're conducting 
Um, and, and this has to do, it's, it's also with these, with these magnetic CVs. So um, these actually have the, the white dwarf in these, in these systems, they, they have magnetic fields that range from one um, to 250 megagauss. So almost a gigagauss um, of a magnetic field strength. Recall the sun is just one gauss. So this is millions, um, almost a billion times stronger than, than the sun. And the biggest puzzle that's come out in, in really the last few years is that 36% of these systems are actually magnetic. They, they harbor a magnetic white dwarf, but only 2% of the, of the pre-CVs, so the systems that will eventually form these, uh, these accreting systems are magnetic. So this, this is a huge puzzle in, in current binary star evolution. How do you get from only 2% of systems being magnetic to 36% of systems being magnetic. Something must happen in the accretion, in this evolution, to lead to the formation of magnetic fields. And the formation of magnetic fields, the generation of these is, it's a hugely interesting problem all the way down from planetary astrophysics to, uh, to galactic scales. Um, so the origin of this of this magnetism is unknown. Um, and. And it, you know these systems are interesting because they're actually the most abundant accreting compact object um, binaries that are that are accreting. So these things like the formation of, of magnetic fields in these systems, which fraction of these systems will explode as type one a supernovae, which fraction of these systems will merge. Um, all this can be very easily studied since since, since there's so many more of, of these systems than, for example, the uh, the X-ray binaries. Um, so this is another X-ray plus plus optical discovery, um, and this was done with uh, with my collaborator Ilham Galulin. Um, so he's the first author on this paper, and um, in the same we basically carried it out in the same way as as for the previous system. We began with the X-ray, and then we we looked at the we looked at the optical. So indeed, you can see it's a very blue star here that that corresponds to this to this X-ray match. Um, again, ZTF. If you first just look at it, if you were to blindly look at this in the optical, kind of boring. It's very faint. I don't want to waste telescope time on a 20th magnitude object. This looks like noise. Let's move on. Let's let's look at something more interesting in the optical. Again, apply the period holding algorithm, end up getting an orbital period of 97 minutes. So this is longer than the, than the 55 minute system. And here's a very deep eclipse. So the system has a lot more ZTF coverage. And here's a very deep, a very narrow eclipse. <laughs> Who cares? It's a 97 minute period CV. A lot of these systems have been found. Um, who cares? So, so here I'm showing you, um, this, is a, this is a famous catalog of, uh, of known CVs here in blue. Um, and then what I'm plotting here, it's a little, it's a little tricky to read, so, so allow me to explain. CVs are born at time equals zero. That's when the donor overflows its, its Roche lobe. They're born somewhere in between four to 10 hours. Um, four to six is a, good, is a good estimate. So CVs are born up here. They come into contact here. Um, what I'm plotting now is the orbital period of the system and the mass ratio the mass of the donor here. Um, I'm going to assume just a constant white dwarf mass. They actually don't accrete enough material, the, the vast majority of these um, in this evolution. So, so that can that can remain constant. So, so this is the picture at t equals zero. That's the picture at um, 0.1 giga years afterward. So they evolve actually to shorter orbital periods. You'll see if they came down to three hours. That happens because of angular momentum loss in the system. Um, in this case, the angular momentum loss is very efficient because the donor star has a magnetic field and it loses angular momentum due to magnetic breaking. That's because you have a you know, particle of ionized gas flowing along the magnetic field lines of the donor star exerts a torque on the whole system, brings it closer together. After a few giga years, you get systems that go all the way down almost to one hour orbital periods. Um, and then you can see, if you look carefully, these evolutionary tracks in black, these are just evolutionary tracks um, that, that, come from, that come from models. 
um, they start to kind of turn back. That happens because once you reach this, this orbital period, you also reach this mass ratio and this donor star mass, which is basically the brown dwarf limit. So you began with a white dwarf plus M dwarf, and now you, you have a, a white dwarf plus brown dwarf. If you have a white dwarf plus brown dwarf, the brown dwarf is degenerate. So as that loses mass, the orbit is no longer going to shrink. It's actually going to expand. And then that's the system that we found. So our system is particularly interesting because it's at that orbital period and we can constrain from the binary parameters. It's, a, it's an eclipsing system. We can constrain that it must be a brown dwarf. So it must be a, a system that's evolved all the way down a few giga years and is now, is now sitting down there. This is often called the period bounce. So you'll hear the term period bouncer um, uh, for all the systems that have evolved past that. So, so this really is a unique system. It's a white dwarf plus brown dwarf. I'll explain um, sort of why, why the white dwarf is magnetic in the next slide. Um, as, I, as I explained, CVs lose angular momentum. They evolve to short orbital periods until the donor becomes a brown dwarf. And every single population synthesis model, um, this has been conducted basically since these came about in the late 80s, all the way up until a recent paper from 2020, they all predict that the Milky Way has been around long enough, white dwarfs have been around long enough, all the donor stars have been around long enough that 40 to 70% of CVs are white dwarf plus brown dwarf systems. But if you remember from introductory textbooks and from my introductory slides, CVs are not introduced as white dwarf plus brown dwarf systems, they're introduced as white dwarf plus main sequence star systems. And this is because observational samples have only yielded um, have only shown about you know two percent of of the systems in those samples are white dwarf plus brown dwarf systems are these period bouncers, and you get a picture that looks something like this. So this is just zoomed in at that at that period bounce where all these CVs are kind of approaching the period minimum, kind of coming down here. Few of them bounce back a little bit, um, but. In, in this picture, none, but if you look at all the other systems, there's maybe only one system that's as extreme as this one that we found. And this has potentially really interesting implications for how long um, mega Gauss magnetic fields can be sustained in white dwarfs. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, um, but one of, the, one of the main reasons that we suspect that this white dwarf has a mega Gauss magnetic field is because typically, if you look at the spectrum of uh, of these lines, as I showed for the uh, um, for the for the other CV, you'll see a double peak, and this comes from an accretion disk. Um, and especially if you're looking at an eclipsing system, at a, at a system that's that's face on, you see the plane of the of the orbit. You should see this double peak. You should see one part of the disk red shifted, one part of it blue shifted. This system is not like that. We know it's eclipsing. We can see the eclipse. However, we don't see a double peak. That that little thing you see doesn't count. That's that's bad signal to noise. Um, so this is a single peak in the in the emission line. This is this is the H alpha emission line, and this is indicative of an accretion stream. That this is seen very commonly in magnetic CVs where you have the the accretion stream produce only a single very broad line. So this system actually raises more questions than answers. Um, because this system is so far evolved along the along the um, along the, the the binary evolution tracks, um, how long has the white dwarf been magnetic? You know, it's definitely been giga years since the system formed. When exactly it generated its magnetic field is is unknown. It's unknown if accretion will stop. You know, brown dwarfs can keep feeding mass. I guess maybe the accretion stream helps feed it better than than a disk. Um, onto the white dwarf. And then my favorite sort of unanswered question for this system, it's what's going to be the ultimate fate? So this, this brown dwarf is going to keep losing mass. It's going to keep being channeled onto the white dwarf. So is this system going to end as a magnetic white dwarf plus giant planet? I don't know. That'd be, that would be really interesting though. It'll be some giant Jupiter-like thing, degenerate um, plus, a, plus a magnetic white dwarf. Eventually they'll separate. 
So I encourage you to check out the the paper for more. This is this has been recently published in in monthly notices. Um, so there's there's plenty of details there on you know why the white dwarf is magnetic and um, just a lot of cool data in the in the last two two papers that I've shown. And the with the last few last few minutes here, um, I, I showed you these two very interesting systems, these very two interesting CVs. But you're thinking, wow, this this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He just says he found an X-ray point found an optical point, maybe got lucky. Maybe got lucky that he's just been kind of cross-matching the, the X-ray plus optical. Um, but I'm going to show you my secret sauce here. I'm going to show you how to make these discoveries for yourself in the X-ray plus optical sky with the, with the data that's going to come out in a week. Um, this, is, this is something that I call the X-ray main sequence. And you might have seen it on archive uh, last Friday. Um, but I'm going to stop here and just let you let you all look at the look at this diagram and look at the various source classifications on the right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say I didn't invent this diagram. Um, people have used modified versions of this since the 80s, since there, there was data from this old X-ray telescope called the Einstein Observatory. Um, but like a dozen sources were on a lot of those plots. Um, before Gaia, it was hard to distinguish between things that were galactic and extragalactic. Um, even though me as a young person and all of us other young people here in the audience, we have no idea what life was like pre-Gaia. Um, so it was difficult to make this diagram in the past. And as far as I know, no one showed all of these source classifications on, on this diagram. So, so what I'm showing here is on the x-axis, it's, um, it's basically a color-color diagram. This is an optical color, Gaia BP minus RP, the blue passband minus a red passband, versus this ratio of the x-ray flux over the optical flux. Um, and what you have is basically all of the compact objects are up here in this corner. They're blue and they have high, high amounts of, uh, of X-ray to optical ratio. Um, all of the active stars are below the cut. They're, they're below here. Um, so below the cut, you have things like YSOs in orange. You have things like active stars, active binaries in green. Um, another thing that's actually below the cut is some of these symbiotic stars. These are also neutron star or white dwarf plus um, plus giants. Um, but all the really exciting systems are, are above the cut where you have all of these CVs in red, including magnetic systems, including some of these ultra compact ones as triangles. Um, you have all these pulsar systems, red backs and black widows. These are very extreme systems in, the, in both the X-ray and the optical because they're systems where a, where a pulsar is in a very close orbit with either a, either an M dwarf or a brown dwarf, and it's irradiating it, it's sort of blasting it with energy and creates this huge intrabinary shock, which uh, which emits in the X rays. All these are cleanly selected above the cut. Um, all of these um, neutron star and black hole X ray binaries as well. Those are all above the cut. So I said how we only know of about two dozen. Um, black hole X-ray binaries that are that are confirmed with this diagram with the new Eurozeta data. This is this is going to hopefully explode. This is going to um, at least double at least double the amount by by some moderate predictions. Um, and the last system is these ultra compact X-ray binaries. Those are also here shown in the shown in the triangles. Um, I'm presenting two cuts here to distinguish between the sources. Both um, the solid line, which is just an empirical cut, um, it's it's the cut that best dis it sort of best distinguishes the two sections and it best encapsulates the, the most compact objects without bringing in false positives and vice versa. Um, the theoretical cut, I won't go into, but this diagram does have physics built into it. Um, the theoretical cut is based on the saturation limit of, of active stars of X-rays due to coronal activity. Um, so I encourage you to read the paper for more and other people have actually explained this as well. Um, but active stars that emit X-rays through their um, coronal activity, um, there's a limit. There's a limit to that. And that limit has been somewhere around 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 in values of um, Fx over, L over F bolometric. 
So after doing the conversion, um, this ratio is thought to be connected to the, to the magnetic dynamo that operates and generates magnetism in low mass stars. Um, but it's a lot of detail, so, so I won't get into that. Um, but nevertheless, it still serves as a as sort of a good cut there. The better tool than the HR diagram, a lot of people have been selecting a lot of these compact objects by, by looking, you can actually look in between, and blue here is the 100 parsec sample from Gaia. Um, and you can look between the white dwarf track and the main sequence track and, and pick out a lot of the CVs. But actually a lot of the, and I made it hard to read on purpose, a lot of the neutron star and black hole systems are hard to pick out, mostly because of reddening, mostly because the disk actually isn't that blue. So you're mostly seeing the donor star, but these systems are all cleanly picked out in the X-ray main sequence. So all these things that get lost in the muck there, you just look in the X-ray main sequence and they're all right there. Um, as a final slide here, I'll show that spectroscopy proves that this, that this works. All of those source classifications, those all come from reliable catalogs. That's all come about like, those are well vetted objects, but just for those who still are kind of skeptical, um, this is cross match between new Erosita data and SDSS five, um, and it's a public release of SDSS five actually. And you can see, so here we predict it's an active M star. Spectrum says it's an active M star. Here we predict it's an active K star. That's what we see. G star. That's what we see. And then above the cut, you look at a cataclysmic variable. And that's exactly what, what we see in the spectrum. And additionally, here's where the other two systems that I showed earlier in the talk, they're up here. Here's where they are on the, on the X-ray main sequence. Um, so with that, I'll just give some, some concluding points for the, for the second part of the talk. And the main one being the X-ray main sequence is just a simple tool, very easy to create. I explained how to do it in the paper um, for selecting, creating compact objects. Um, and this can inform the spectroscopic surveys of the future, SDSS-5, DESI, Foremost, Weave, um, look into certain parts of parameter space to get whatever your favorite object is. Uh, the other important point is that all these exotic accreting white dwarfs, brown dwarf systems, ultra compact systems, the X-ray picks them out very nicely. So these might be more common than, than we previously suspected. Um, and the final takeaway is the multi-wavelength future is bright. So coming soon, um, I'll, I'll present large samples um, that come from X-ray cross matches with ZTF, with Gaia, and then coming in just a year here with uh, with Ruben LSST. Uh, thank you for your for your attention. Thanks, Tony, for that uh, talk about a bunch of exciting objects. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody who has to leave. Uh, feel free to do so, but uh, let's take questions from both uh, people online and people in the room. If you're in the room, uh, if you can come over a little closer uh, so you can directly speak to the microphone. Hi, thanks for the talk. I was just wa I just wanted to ask about the magnetic and non-magnetic CVs. Um, so did you notice that the period, are the period distributions between the two um, systems, do they match? Does the, the distributions match? Um, can you constrain from that how they gain this magnetic field? That's um, a great question. Um, yeah, and that's something that I've been looking a lot into recently. I don't, I don't have a, a slide here, um, but what you'll see, I'll just show everything on this on this other diagram here. Um, what you'll see is that above this sort of gap above this like four hours, there's fewer magnetic systems. Um, and then as you get down here, you get a mix of them. Um, and so there's fewer than proportionally. So something happens, um, something happens in between like four-ish hours and two-ish hours. It, it's pretty clear now that they don't come out of the common envelope phase with magnetic fields, but it's somehow generated in these orbital periods. Um, but there's yeah, no clear so trend. It, yeah, as it comes close to the to the uh, to the other to the companion, the tidal forces to actually maybe jumpstart the magnetic field. You know. It's yeah. Open open. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's an unsolved problem that uh, only more systems will solve. Yeah. Thanks.
So, uh, Tony, at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, the initial Gaia data releases uh, showed, uh, made it hinted that there were more of these uh, black hole binaries than uh, ended up to be the case. I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about what you mean about that and like uh, the selection effects involved. Yeah, so that's a, a lot of those details are in are in Kareem's first and second papers on on both systems. But um, let me go back. I guess the best diagram to show that is here. Yeah. Um, so Gaia has been has been monitoring the sky since twenty fourteen, and um, I believe up to data release three, I believe that's only data from 2014 to 2017. So I think that was the amount of data that was used for that data release. And that already limits you. Um, the, the, way, the way that these systems were, were identified is, um, is two things. You can, so Gaia identified the astrometric motion of the donor star around the black hole and Gaia to a spectrograph, um, it saw the lines of the donor and said, this is a single line system. It's not a, it's not a double line system that's comprised of two normal stars. So if it's a single line system, um, you can see its astrometric motion around a black hole. Um, you know its period. It, it gave it, like Gaia gave sort of a rough period, a, a rough solution to the orbital parameters um, and said, okay, the mass function says that it has to be a, you know, greater than five solar masses should be a black hole. Um, that limits you. You need to have a bright enough star such that it was released with Gaia data release three. They, they did a cut on the types of stars that were released. They only released a certain amount of single lined binaries. Um, and that also limited you in the period space, You know, only things that could have completed or completed most of its orbit in three years from 2014 to 2017 actually made it into the sample. So most of the really wide systems, which is actually what we expect this 10 to the four um, giant plus black hole systems to be, all the wide systems that have separations of like five, 10, 100 years, um, all of those were missed. And Gaia actually won't be sensitive enough to those. Um, so it's a complicated selection function of, is its orbital period short enough, but also is it long enough to have enough astrometric motion for Gaia to pick out are the, are the right calcium triplet spectral lines there? Is it a single line binary or does it have some other weird effect? Um, so, so those initially made it seem like, wow, it's pretty rare to pick these out. The fact that Gaia found them means there's like a million um, or a couple of millions of, of Gaia black holes. Um, but this modeling shows that, that that should be reduced by by a factor of like a factor of a hundred. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Um, just one for one more for me. So you mentioned about ice identifying black holes by accretion from the ISM. And I was wondering, how would you validate these if you detect these in an X-ray observation uh, as an X-ray source? How would you know that this is what you're seeing? Yeah, that would be super hard. Um, one of the one of the main takeaways would be, I guess, that it would have to have a pretty hard spectrum like this. Um, generally, harder X-ray sources are, are more rare than soft sources. Um, so if you're looking at a giant molecular cloud, you see a hard X-ray spectrum. There's other papers that predict, I mean, even here you can see that there's a predicted optical luminosity from the disk. There's a predicted infrared luminosity from the from the disk, which is a lot lower. Um, so maybe some predictions along those lines that the best bet is probably if there's a jet and there's papers that have, that have looked at this too, if there's a jet, um, then this would also be radio bright. And for the systems that would be close enough to be detectable in x-rays, they should probably also be close enough that, um, that are, you know, VLA or Meerkat or ASCAP, any of the, any of the radio telescopes could also, could also see evidence of a jet.